February 1991, tank crews of the U.S. Armored Division's lie in wait in the desert of southern Iraq, ready to face the heavy armor of Saddam Hussein's Republican Guard. But the tank that would spearhead the assault was untested on the battlefield and shrouded in controversy. March 2003, the brutes of the battlefield roll across the Iraqi desert once again. Destination Baghdad. Now, M1 Abrams Super Tank on Modern Marvels. The development of the battle tank revolutionized warfare. They were designed to break the stalemate in the trenches of the First World War. But during World War II, the tank came of age. Fast-moving panzers led the Nazis' stunning Blitzkrieg victories of 1940. In 1941, more than 3,500 German panzers led the Nazi invasion of Soviet Russia. Russian T-34, the standard battle tank of the Soviet army, was produced in tens of thousands in Tankograd, a huge new specialized production center hidden deep in Siberia. These superb machines, a match for almost anything the Germans had, led the Russian advance from Kursk to Berlin. When the United States mobilized for war, Chrysler built a giant tank arsenal in Detroit. Soon, tens of thousands of M4 Sherman tanks began pouring off the production line. The Sherman became the universal allied tank of the war, leading the breakout from Normandy and the final onslaught against Nazi Germany. first sight of a Sherman, there it was, a huge tank, a veritable Rolls Royce compared with what we'd been used to. We knew we had the arsenal of democracy. The pride was that uh, Americans could do it. We could manufacture these tanks. And we were told they were good tanks and they would help us win the war. In late 1944, the German high command concentrated their war industry on the development of superior weapons. In an intensive effort to defeat the Allied forces, they produced heavier and heavier tanks like the Tiger and the King Tiger. These tanks were feared by the Allies, but there were too few of them to turn the tide of war. The design of tanks had always been a compromise between armor, firepower, and mobility. The heavier the armor, the better the protection, but slower the speed. The bigger the gun, the heavier the casing needed to carry it. Victory or defeat depended on a balance between these characteristics. During the Cold War, the Soviet Union was years ahead of the West in the development of tank technology. They had produced a range of low-profile designs that were harder to identify and to hit. The U.S. and West Germany, now allies, collaborated to produce a new tank of the century that would incorporate the latest scientific developments. By 1969, with over $400 million spent, the project was way over budget. Congress pulled the plug. But the U.S. still needed a new generation of battle tanks. In 1972, both Chrysler and General Motors were asked to come up with new designs. The United States hadn't had a new tank for quite a number of years, and the Army felt the need to incorporate the knowledge that was available then uh, into a new tank that would give them better firepower, more mobility, and reliability. The Army did, I think, a very intelligent, very smart job of managing the program. The first thing they did was to get a group of seasoned, experienced tankers together at Fort Knox and ask these gentlemen, what is it you'd like to have in the next generation tank? It's somewhat similar to putting a kid in a candy store. And what came out of that was a very tough and demanding set of requirements. World events would also play an important role in shaping the design. In October 1973, 
The Middle East War saw the largest tank versus tank battle since World War II. Israeli armored brigades fought with British Centurion tanks and the latest American patents. The Egyptian and the Syrian forces were armed with the modern Soviet T-62 tank. The Middle East War proved the tank remained the dominant weapon on the modern battlefield. The U.S. Army was now more committed than ever to design a new main battle tank. For U.S. tank designers, the war provided a unique opportunity. They closely tracked the strengths and weaknesses of the armored divisions and brought the results to the design table. Another factor that would affect the tank's overall design was the new top-secret British Chauvin armor, codenamed Burlington by the Army. In 1978, successful impact tests on the secret Burlington armor were held at the Army's Aberdeen Proving Ground. There are two basic kinds of tank ammunition. One is kinetic energy. Brute force pushes a hole through the armor, and it's uh, very effective. The other type of uh, anti-tank round is called a chemical energy round. Molten metal comes out of the front of the shell in a finger-sized jet that will burn a hole through several feet of steel. Now, how can we defeat both? Well, the chopper armor did that. November 12, 1976. Chrysler was declared the winner of the new contract. They beat General Motors by designing a turret that reduced costs and by incorporating a revolutionary gas turbine engine. It was the beginning of a new era in tank design. I recall very well the uh, announcement that we had won and uh, I stepped on top of a drafting table and uh, I can still feel the uh, resounding applause knowing that the Army had chosen our group to proceed with it and it was just a, a moment of elation that was hard to, uh, to capture in words. But the real winner was the U.S. Army. In just two years, they made a sensational leap forward in tank technology. In 1978, the first of this new generation of tanks rolled off the production line. The M1 Abrams super tank was born. It was quite an impressive vehicle. You compared it against the you know, M60, which was our top of the line at the time. It's lower, it's more angular, its design looks more menacing. Its armor is not just all steel. It's designed to defeat a wider range of, of munitions. And its fire control system, though similar to the M60, was in fact superior. So, especially when you couple it with a jet engine that's 1,500 horsepower, this, this beast moved faster, more quickly, was more survivable, and was at least as lethal as its predecessors. With the birth of this terrifying fighting machine, the battlefield would never be the same again. After World War II, the U.S. Sherman tank continued to serve armies throughout the world, taking to the battlefield as recently as 1973. M1 Abrams Super Tank will return on Modern Marvels. In 1980, the new M1 Abrams Super Tank entered military service, but its early days were troubled and controversial. It was the world's top high-tech war machine, but many doubted its combat survivability. In the post-Vietnam era of the late 80s, the morale of U.S. forces was at an all-time low. The new M1 battle tank became a key symbol of the Reagan defense buildup and an easy target for those opposed to an increase in defense spending. In this era of Cold War games and electronic warfare, the new generation of battle tank required a completely different approach to crew training. A radical new national training center was established, OP4, Opposing Forces. 
There, real-life war games were carried out with American soldiers playing the role of Soviet forces. William Heidner took part in these exercises. You could buy a set of, of Soviet tanks uh, to include a complete training package on how to use those tanks. And of course, when their trainers showed up to teach country X how to use these, these new tanks and infantry fighting vehicles, they were taught the Soviet methodology. If we were to go to war somewhere besides the central plains of Europe against the Warsaw Pact, you're still likely to run into the same types of equipment and the same types of tactics. We were known as Krasnovians uh, from the, the fictional town of, or fictional country of Krasnovia. We had a solid OD green uniform. We would wear a Russian-style rank insignia and a, a Russian-style uh, epaulet and, and branch insignia on our collars. The aim was to replicate combat as close as possible without spilling blood. To operate effectively as a team, modern tank crews require both a highly technical skill base and the mental agility to change roles if necessary when under fire. The training had to be improved because you know how you have a faster tank, it, it traverses faster, it shoots faster, uh, you have a knee switch, you have your elevation uncoupled, the training had to be more intense. The gunner skill is necessary, taking a proper rip sight, sight picture. All these things had to be done in order to master that tank because it was fast. We were, uh, we were like a family. Your tank crew is your family. You're going through the same thing. You're experiencing everything the next guy is. You know, it's not like, hey, he's got a Mercedes and I got a Pinto or something, you know. It's just, you're all quite equal, regardless of the rank. I got the Abrams has a crew of four. The commander sits above and behind the gunner in the main turret compartment with the loader to their left. The driver sits alone in the front of the tank. The driver now had to focus on driving with buttoned up and, and getting used to the speed because a lot of drivers during nighttime engagements or during the night uh, would run so fast down a course road that they would lose track of where they were. You had to practice with him the, the proper platform in order for him to maintain a stable platform to allow the crew to shoot well and then also keep us on the course road. The loader had to be skilled in his position. He had to be able to pop that door open after the round was fired, pull around, load it, get it armed. We were looking for three seconds, three to four, that's what we wanted. After you fired a few rounds and you've got the, the caps rolling around on the floor, um, add to that machine gun brass that's lying around and uh, I could feel the heat coming up through both the, the rubber chemical boots and into my uh, regular boots so uh, which was nice actually in the winter time because it was cold the commander has six periscopes that provide 360 degree vision the thing with uh, with the periscopes is certainly you can uh, navigate and fight down but you just, you still don't get all of the, the panorama, if you will, of being out and looking left and right to your tanks. But in addition, they have a, what they call a commander's independent viewer, where you have your own thermal device that you can swing left or right. And it's made it easier to be down inside the tank as opposed to outside. Still, old guys like me prefer being up out where we can look around. M1 Abrams, the gunner uses a thermal imaging system along with a laser rangefinder for extraordinarily accurate fire. But the designers decided not to incorporate an auto loading system. If you put a, an auto loader in there with some 100 plus parts, how can that be as reliable as a single individual who's manhandling and loading the ammunition manually? The new tank had many other pioneering features. The greatest fear of any tanker since its invention was of being burnt alive or dying from exploding ammunition in a molten coffin. Some of the scariest images that were told about previous tanks were, that, well, you get you get hit with a heat round. It's going to burn a hole through there. It's going to be like a torch. It's going to send molten armor all over the place and burn you up. Or you're going to get a kinetic energy round and come flying through your tank and go bouncing around like a ping pong ball, you know, and take half of you out the other side. 
To protect the tank crew, one of the Abrams' most innovative features was the blowout panels. As far as uh, some of the protection that the M1 provided had taken a hit was the fact that uh, he had blow off panels that had been installed in the turrets and shut heavy, thick metal doors so that uh, if hit from the rear or the side of the turret where the ammunition would be ignited, uh, those doors would withstand that blast so that in the event of a fire, the ammo would blow up and not into the crew compartment. For night vision, the driver uses an image intensifier starlight periscope. This enables a crew to engage targets rapidly and successfully, despite the darkness of night or daytime battlefield conditions of dust and smoke. Early models of the Abrams weighed in at 60 tons. They were powered by a gas turbine engine and could travel up to 45 miles per hour. The engine was much quieter and easier to maintain. And with no smoke signature, the tank was much harder to detect. Early models had a 105 millimeter cannon. But in the mid 80s, this was replaced by a much more powerful German made 120 millimeter main gun. The Abrams incorporated everything that latest advanced technology could offer. But it still had its critics. It was accused of being a gas guzzler, of being too heavy to transport to a new theater of war, and at $4.3 million a piece of being far too expensive. During the Cold War, the Abrams was intended as one of the key defensive weapons to protect Europe from a Soviet-led attack by the communist bloc. In September 1982, during the NATO war games in Germany, the Abrams made its tactical debut. The impressive accuracy of the Abrams demonstrated its outstanding ability in a world of electronic warfare as a hunter and a killer. It was a turning point in armored warfare. We knew we had a winner across NATO, probably three or four years into service, I would say by the mid 80s. The tank could be doing 25 or 30 miles an hour over terrain, and you are literally shooting on the move. And when it could demonstrate that capability, that was when I think uh, military professionals certainly realized that this is a fine armored vehicle, and in fact, lives up to its bargain. What we didn't know was exactly how it matched up against its adversaries. By the late 1980s, the Cold War was coming to an end, and the tank was still untested in a real field of battle. All of that was about to change. The Abrams' baptism of fire would be in a very different conflict, a war that would reshape U.S. foreign policy. The echoes of which are with us today, the Gulf War. The M1 Abrams is so heavy that the largest cargo aircraft in the U.S. Air Force, the C-5 Galaxy, can only handle one tank per trip. M1 Abrams Super Tank will return on Modern Marvels. For over 10 years, the Abrams remained untested in the field of battle. Critics blasted its high production costs and questioned the combat survivability of its electronic warfare systems. But the Abrams was about to enter its trial by fire. Beginning in 1980, Iraq and Iran had fought each other in a long and bloody war. Hundreds of thousands of people lost their lives or were horribly mutilated. In 1988, this brutal struggle came to an end with Iraq's victory. Saddam Hussein, the Iraqi dictator, built up a formidable war machine supplied by both the West and by the Soviets. Iraq was left with huge debts. Hussein accused neighboring oil-rich Kuwait of lowering oil prices. On August 2, 1990, the Iraqi dictator gave the order for Iraqi forces to invade Kuwait. Saddam Hussein was confident that the West would not respond, but he had badly miscalculated. President Bush Sr. acted quickly and put together a coalition of Western and Arab states committed to the overthrow of Saddam's rule in Kuwait. 
vast army began to deploy in the deserts of Arabia. The Iraqi army had a considerable array of tanks, mostly purchased from the former Soviet Union. Among these were a thousand modern Russian T-72s. We certainly didn't underestimate them. We, we thought there was going to be a very formidable enemy. The feeling was that this could be a terrible fight with, with tremendous casualties and it could go for a very long time. Half a million Americans and other Allied troops began to arrive in Saudi Arabia in an enormous military buildup along the Iraqi border. The operation Desert Shield was led by General Norman Schwarzkopf. After a decade of development and training, the M1 Abrams was about to be put to the test in real battle combat. The latest model, the M1A1, was urgently deployed to the Gulf. Evolutionary in design, the new version had upgraded computerized gunnery. The stabilized gun mount enabled it to fire reliably while traveling at high speed over rough ground. The combination of maneuverability, longer range and night vision would give the crews the opportunity of defeating any tank in the Iraqi army. The Abrams tank crews needed to acclimate to the desert and for five months engaged in simulated training in preparation to take on the Iraqis' Russian T-72s. Dan Miller, captain of Iron Troop, had spent five years on war games, training to fight on the central plains of Germany. We had trained to fight the Warsaw Pact, so when we were discovering that we were going to Saudi Arabia, it was surprising. It wasn't so much that we were concerned, hey, we, we, we trained to fight these guys, now we're gonna go fight the Iraqis. Um, but, hey, at least we're gonna get, get in there and get in the fight, because that's soldiers typically wanna ride to the sound of the guns. That's typical reactions. Went out into the desert um, and spent the next five months camped on our tanks in the desert waiting. Uh, we were out there uh, you know, through, through the holidays and uh, through Christmas and New Year's and right up into the New Year. Um, we spent a lot of time maneuvering in the desert, um, practicing, especially with me coming out of basic training. I couldn't tell a, 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 a tank cannon from a 50 caliber machine gun. I, mean, I, I didn't know any of this stuff. Um, but spending those five months out in the desert really gave us a chance to hone our skills. The tactics of the, we're going to change the long-range gunnery. We knew that. We're shooting across a flat plane. Um, and we were moving in different formations than we ever moved before on a scale of vehicles that had not been done before. On January 16th, 1991, the air war against Iraq began. Over succeeding weeks, the high-precision aerial onslaught pummeled Iraq's military infrastructure. But Iraq's huge army, estimated at about one million men, remained undefeated on the ground. Some commanders argued that Iraq could be defeated by the air campaign alone. But President Bush Sr. decided on a short, sharp, and decisive ground action, determined to keep casualties to the minimum. The commanders now maneuvered men and machines into position. The new and unproven Abrams main battle tank was placed right on the front line. For the men who would crew these tanks, the battle ahead stirred very different emotions. My personal fear was that I would make a bad decision that would get my guys hurt or killed. I was more worried about that than I was about, you know, personal fear of getting hurt or whatever. You just don't think it's going to happen to me. Well, we were prepared for anything, and I really wasn't too concerned with anything at all when I was on my tank. You know, just being away from it was scary to me. My biggest fear going over there was that I was going to be called on to kill people. That, you know, I'd find myself in some village in Iraq somewhere gunning down, you know, children armed with RPGs or something like that. And, and I don't think 18... 18-year-olds, 19-year-olds think about the danger to themselves. I can't get hurt. Yeah. But the tank's critics remained vocal. 
Many believed that the Abrams would simply jam up in the sands of the desert. Under Saddam's threat of engaging the coalition in the mother of all battles, the young tank crews led their M1s onto the battlefield. For five months, the coalition forces had practiced, patrolled, and maneuvered in preparation for battle. Desert Shield would soon no longer be an air war. For the Abrams crews, the days of simulated combat were over. The Iraqi army had been worn down by constant attacks from the coalition airstrikes. Conscripts stuck out in foxholes in the desert front line had little will left to fight. Only the elite Republican Guard was ready and eager to take on the West with a force of 100,000 men and 1,000 tanks. At 4 a.m. on February 24, 1991, the ground war was launched. Operation Desert Storm. Two Marine divisions first attacked from the south, quickly penetrating what was known as the Saddam Line. They made rapid progress towards Kuwait City, slowed only by the sheer numbers of prisoners on the battlefield. Bad weather and smoke from the oil fields the Iraqis had set on fire obscured the desert. And everywhere, bombs and mines exploded, adding to the chaos. Dan Miller's cavalry troop was given a deadly mission to seek, find, and engage the enemy. American cavalry is armed heavily enough to fight for information. We don't have to employ a standoff, look, develop information and send the report back. I can make you shoot at me, that tells me where you are, and I can either kill you myself or pop back, report higher, and allow a higher level commander to pass a whole division through to come and kill you. That's the role of American cavalry. That's what we did that day. On February 26th, the first major tank engagement took place. The Battle of 73 Easting began with well-dug-in units of the Republican Guard. The Abrams tanks of Eagle Troop II armored cavalry led the assault by using their thermal visioning to identify the Iraqi tanks. Abrams, its first shooting war had phenomenal results. It is a busy, busy battlefield. And you just, you don't realize, to me it seemed like it was four or five hours, but it was really probably about an hour and a half engagement from start to finish with about 25 minutes of real serious, intense, two-way range. They're shooting at us, uh, we're shooting at them, they're bringing mortar rounds in on us. Typically, the, the Soviets, when you would put them under artillery, their doctrine was to, to close with you as fast as possible. That's exactly what I did with Iron Troop, which I said, okay, let's advance faster so that we could get in amongst them. So eventually, between our counter-battery fire and the fact that we were getting too close for them to, to use it, it took, an, it took another tool out of his box that he could use against my guys. In just 23 minutes of combat, Nine lone American tanks had taken on and wiped out all 38 Iraqi armored vehicles. They had cut a three-mile swath of destruction and taken out Iraq's most capable armor. I knew that, it, that the, the M1 was doing well from the first round. We fired at a real target. Um, I shot my first round, and my gunner shot his first round at 2,900 meters, popped the turret off a tank, and went up an explosion, and I'm going, yeah, this is neat stuff. You know, that round really will blow a turret off. In the darkness, the Iraqi gunners fired wildly at the muzzle flashes from American tanks on the move. But burning Iraqi vehicles made the battlefield so bright that Steed's thermals whited out a temporary blindness which made the tank vulnerable to enemy fire. 
we could see the damage that had been wreaked. You had burned out hulks, you had turrets flipped over. You had, you had shell, shell shocked Iraqis. Steed was then ordered to stop and round up some Iraqi prisoners ahead of him. The rest of the battalion had driven off. They were gone. And my platoon leader was somewhere behind me, which I had no idea where he was. He stopped and signaled the Iraqis trying to surrender. Just then, a burning Iraqi hulk silhouetted his tank. Hidden in the burning battlefield, just a thousand yards away, a lone T-72 crew sighted the illuminated Abrams, an unbelievable target. The T-72 had a perfect sight on the most vulnerable part of the Abrams, the side of the gun turret. The enemy's autoloader swung into action with a deadly 125 millimeter heat round. It was almost surreal. It was kind of dreamlike in a way. I'm sitting there looking in my front, watching, keeping an eye on the prisoners, keeping an eye on vehicles of my right and left. The round came in the left side of the, the tank. My loader got hit in the legs, and he crawled over the side. By the time Steed regained consciousness, the fire extinguishers had worked, but the tank was still an easy target and in danger of exploding. Steed's first concern was for his gunner. My gunner was trying to come up in front of me because the black smoke was pouring out of the vehicle, and I was, I was trying to get him under control so that we could get up on top and see what's wrong. So I reached down in there to get him, I turned around and noticed my blast doors were open. I was concerned about ammunition being cooked off. Um, so I tried to push it shut. I was able to close the door, get it re-secured, we got him out. Um, I had a long spaghetti cord so I could, I could still talk on the radio, so I was talking to my commander, explaining to him that we'd been hit, uh, and giving him a status on my people. And then I went back to the tank trying to get it started because we needed to ride out of there. All the warning lights, everything was lit up. It, it would turn over, but it wouldn't drink. So at that point, uh, we started trying to figure out how are we going to get out of here. Steed and his injured crew were in serious danger. After hiding from the enemy at the rear of the tank for nearly an hour, one of Steed's platoons sighted the stricken Abrams and came to their aid. I was kind of pissed. You know, I was pissed I was in a position that caused this to begin with. And uh, it was fair to say that I wanted to continue to do more to keep that from happening to somebody else. With his wounded crew safe, Steed insisted on taking command of the tank, and he returned to the battle. For his heroic action, Tony Steed was later awarded the Bronze Star for Valor. It's been obvious since tank warfare began to me, but you don't stop a rolling tank in the middle of a battle area. We're not POW wagons. So that changed the SOP real quick, like, now, within the platoon, within the unit, within the battalion, new orders were issued. Um, so that, that wouldn't happen again. At dawn the following morning, the Iraqi army appeared to be withdrawing to the north towards Basra. But the tanks of the Republican Guard had dug in behind a six-mile ridge of high ground. Abrams would face its toughest opposition yet. In the largest armored conflict since World War II, the Abrams was about to play a major role in one of the great tank battles of the 20th century, the Battle of Medina Ridge. The largest single tank engagement of the whirlwind war of Desert Storm took place on the fourth day of fighting at Medina Ridge on February 27, 1991. The M1 Abrams tanks of the U.S. 1st and 3rd Armored Divisions now faced off against 300 T-72 tanks of the elite battle-hardened Republican Guard. Despite smoke and sand, 
the thermal sites could identify the Iraqi T-72 tanks long before the enemy could see them. Even where they had been dug in behind several feet of sand, the Iraqi tanks could be picked out. Incredibly, the Abrams was able to hit the T-72s at 3,500 yards, well before the Abrams was visible through the optical sights of the Soviet-made tanks. When the Abrams used a depleted uranium round, it could destroy a T-72 with a single shell. The Iraqi tanks exploded in a sheet of flame. The Iraqi tank crews tried firing back at the Abrams tanks when they could see them, but they were out of range. After five months of waiting in the desert, loader Sheehan Miles was prepping his tank when he was ordered into action. We were supposed to cross the border at midnight, and uh, as I was prepping the tank and getting everything ready around 11 o'clock in the morning, all of a sudden, my platoon leader comes running back across the, uh, the uh, assembly area, yelling, everybody get ready, we're leaving now. And uh, on five minutes notice, we loaded everything up in the tank as quick as we could, and got in and, and moved out. So when it came time to fire it in combat, of course, the, the ammo door was clogged with sand, and I couldn't open it. And the breach was filled with sand, and the main gun wouldn't fire. And meanwhile, you know, we're, people are shooting at us, and nothing was working. And after I hit the circuit breaker, you know, I'm halfway back into my position when uh, uh, the gunner fired, and it went off that time and practically knocked me out of my seat. Under cover of darkness, the Abrams' superior gunnery range and night weapon systems were decisive. At Medina Ridge, when we first came into contact, uh, the Red Platoon had actually identified the targets, and uh, we were then given the okay to engage, and we were told at that time that there was, there was nothing in front of us but enemy. So we pulled up online and started engaging targets. Our weapon systems can reach out and touch at a distance. And uh, our sights are much better than the Soviet-made tanks. And I, I wasn't scared at all or threatened by any other vehicle on the battlefield. I was just so intrigued, you know. I was looking around. This is the first time I've ever been away from home. I was actually in combat. I felt so distant. During the Battle of Medina Ridge, the Abrams gun had proved superior to that of the T-72. It was like a turkey shoot, and with their tanks being shot up, the Iraqi resolve to fight began to fade. By the end of the battle, only four Abrams tanks had taken direct hits, but due to the durability of its armor, all crews survived. For the majority of the Abrams crews, tank warfare was long-range and impersonal. Loader Gene Benson, however, had a rare face-to-face -face encounter with an Iraqi soldier of the Republican Guard. He was wounded, so as we're coming up to him, I got my 240 on him. You know, for if, if he had a weapon or anything like that, I would be ready. And I was already locked and loaded and, and ready to go. But he had his hand up and he was waving, like, help me. And I almost grabbed my camera and took a picture of him you know, as, as opposed to shooting him. But then I said, hey, no, you know, we were told this is degrading. And I said, okay, well, we'll just pass by. Close encounters with the horror of war had a profound effect on the 18-year-old loader Sheehan Miles. We did have one incident where uh, some trucks came rushing through our position in the middle of the night. and. Uh, you know, we, we did what you do when unknown trucks come rushing towards your position in the middle of the night. We, we shot them, and one of them was a fuel truck, and it caught the other truck on fire, and that was full of people. And they all came out running, and they were on fire, and we machine gunned them and, uh, um, and killed them all. You know, again, that was tough to live with um, for a long time. I was angry because the, the, the way we prosecuted that particular mission you know, sending a tank company down this crowded road that was already covered in burning and destroyed equipment that helicopters had fired up just didn't make any sense to me. But, uh, you know, I, was, I wasn't an officer. I'm not the kind of person who makes those calls. 
The destructive power of the battalions of tanks was overwhelming. In just over two hours, 186 Iraqi tanks and 127 armored vehicles, the cream of Saddam's forces, were destroyed. The battle was a turning point. The Iraqi army was in full-scale retreat towards Basra. President Bush Sr. declared a ceasefire at midnight on February 28th. After 100 hours of the ground war, General Schwarzkopf and the coalition forces had won a stunning victory. Kuwait was now free. After the war, it was estimated that the Iraqis had lost 3,700 tanks. Over 20,000 men were killed and tens of thousands wounded. Miraculously, during the whole conflict, only 18 Abrams had been disabled and just four knocked out by Iraqi anti-tank fire. Not a single member of an Abrams tank crew had been killed by enemy fire. The combination of the super tank's advanced technology and the superior training and discipline of the crews had won the day. Twelve years later, Saddam Hussein and his sons must leave Iraq within 48 hours. March 20th, 2003, America is again at war with Iraq. And once more, the M1 Abrams will prove itself a formidable weapon. Within 24 hours of the start of Operation Iraqi Freedom, the 3rd Infantry's 7th Cavalry is rolling, unopposed across the desert. Their destination, Baghdad. In the first three days, they move with breathtaking speed, covering some 300 miles. Even the brutal sandstorms barely slow their progress. Iraqi pickup trucks mounted with primitive missiles and automatic rifles charge the tanks. Their attacks are mostly suicidal. There will be no spectacular tank-on-tank -tank battles in this war. But not all Abrams will escape unscathed. And one Abrams driver is shot and killed, and the tank he is operating falls into a river. His entire crew perishes with him. After days of intense aerial bombardment, the M1 Abrams rolls into Saddam International Airport, enters the grounds of a presidential palace, and then moves into the heart of the city. This is psychological warfare. The army calls it Thunder Run. After only three weeks, the war is declared over. And the legacy of the M1 Abrams is secure. Uh, we all know that the M1 strengths are its armor, its uh, maneuverability. Uh, you can fire offensively or defensively. It was just awesome. After all that happened, I would say that the Abrams uh, survivability, a, you know, a number one. It kept my crew from getting killed.